the soiled ones in the boiler, my mother told me, showing me how to hook the loops of gauze-covered wadding pads onto an elastic belt, remembering how my grandmother had given her strips of rag she'd had to wash out every month for herself. The grandmother who had her chair by the boiler, who I loved but was plotting to murder before she murdered my mother, or my mother shaking, sobbing, hurling plates and cups, screaming she wished she'd never been born, screeching devil and witch, murdered her. I piled up the pads until the smell satisfied me. Was the smell of a corpse. How could you do such a thing? My mother asked, finding them at the bottom of the wardrobe, where the year before she'd found a cache of navy blue knickers stained with black jelly clots. I thought were my wickedness oozing out of me. There was nothing simple about it even then. An 11-year-old's hunger for the wet perfection of the Alhambra. The musky torsos of football stars. Ancient Egypt and Jacques Cousteau's lurching empires of the sea. Bazaars in Mughal India. The sacred plunge into a Cadbury's five-star bar. Kachinjanga. Kisses bluer than the Adriatic. Honey stain of sunlight on temple walls. A moon lava Parthenon. Draught of northern air in Scottish castles. The child god craving to pop a universe into one's mouth. It's back again, the lust. That is the deepest I have known. Celebrated by paperback romances in station bookstores. By poets in the dungeons of Toledo. By bards crooning foreverness and gut thump on FM radio in Bombay traffic jams. And undoing. And unmaking. Raw. A monsoonal ferocity of need. Mm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you got to enjoy that. A bit rough and ready there. <laughs> Your daughter is ugly. She knows loss intimately, carries whole cities in her belly. As a child, relatives wouldn't hold her. She was splintered wood and seawater. They said she reminded them of the war. On her 15th birthday, you taught her how to tie her hair like rope and smoke it over burning frankincense. You made her gargle rose water, and while she coughed, said, I can't tell girls like you shouldn't smell of lonely or empty. You are her mother. Why did you not warn her, hold her like a rotting boat, and tell her that men will not love her if she's covered in continents, if her teeth are small colonies, if her stomach is an island, if her thighs are borders, what man wants to lay down and watch the world burn in his bedroom? Your daughter's face is a small riot, her hands a civil war, a refugee camp behind each ear, a body littered with ugly things. But God, doesn't she wear the world well? Because of my crown, I came to doubt the word and the power of trichologians to trim it. They sheared long curls of mortality with their razors and knives. A flock of goats on the mountains of Gilead. Her hair is like unto a mantle of purpurri. 
If a woman should go bareheaded, she shall be shown. And if this step be distasteful to her, she shall be shaved as well. Should a woman be dragged by her hair to a fold as a lamb to the slaughter by shepherds? Were they bald? Standing before your altar in my worst nightmares, I see a woman shorn being drowned as a witch, each single hair plucked out. Another girl reaches out to her. She is tarred and feathered in dark stains. She turns into Esther, offers shit and mud instead of rare perfumes. Jesus, what would you say today to women who wear veils? Is there a place for us in your sanctum? We long to hear that story again and again, the one about a sinner. You let her dry your feet with the unfettered beauty of her hair, and nobody stopped her. Nobody. Julia wears a pink dress and earrings, has green eyes and a ponytail. She has herpes, hepatitis, thrush, staphylococcus, cervical erosion, HIV. She lives with her mum and dad in a studio flat in an old district of Kiev. They have three cats, Hanker, Ephedra, Morpheus, Opium, Ephedrine, Morphine. She learns English before Euro 2012. My name is Julia, $50, 50 minutes. I got married. I got married to myself. <laughs> I said yes. A yes that took years to arrive. Years of unspeakable suffering. Of crying with the rain. Of shutting myself in my room because I, the great love of my existence, did not call myself. Did not write to myself. Did not visit myself. And at times, when I get the courage to call myself, to say, hello, am I well? I wouldn't come to the phone. <laughs> I even put myself on a list of pains in the neck. I didn't want to talk with, because they drove me nuts. Because they wouldn't let me alone. Because they backed me into corners because I couldn't stand them. At the end, I didn't even pretend when I asked if I was there. I let myself know, tactfully, that I was fed up with myself. And one day, I stopped calling myself, and stopped calling myself. And so much time went by that I missed me. So I said, how long has it been since I called? Ages. Must be ages. And I called myself, and I answered. I couldn't believe it. Because though it's hard to believe, I hadn't healed. I'd only been bleeding. Then I said, hello, is that me? <clears throat> it's me, I said, and added, it's been a long time since we've heard I from myself or myself from me. Would I like to come over? Yes, I said. And we met again, in peace. And I felt good with myself. And myself as well felt good with me. And so, day after day, I am together. And not even death can be part. I've never seen a soul detached from its gender. But I'd like to. I'd like to see my own that way, free of its female tethers. Maybe it would be like riding a horse. The rider, the human one, Everyone looks at the horse.
Where's Arlen? We want some of that. I want some of that.